My name is Jonathan Yardley. I'm the book critic of the Washington Post. Um, and I admire your perseverance and staying hanging tough on this rather difficult day. Um, it's really my great pleasure to introduce the Director of Publishing at the Library of Congress. Probably most of you, except those who work at the library, are not, not aware that for many years the, the library has had a, a small but extremely distinguished publishing division that's produced a number of absolutely first-rate books. I understand that its major title for this fall is going to be a large illustrated uh, collection of the library's immense holdings in American baseball history, a book I'm very much looking forward to seeing. This has been my Mississippi day. This morning I interviewed John Grisham, who is of course uh, a Mississippian, and this afternoon I'm introducing Ralph Eubanks, who comes from a very different Mississippi than, than John Grisham's, but who's, um, who's, who went to college with um, John Grisham's sister and, um, 30 years ago, and proof, proof that Mississippians cross in many different paths. Um, Ralph is a, is, comes from a family with an immensely interesting multicultural mix. Um, among other things, he was rem reminding me just a minute ago that, that, um, that he's a Catholic, and there are not many Catholics in Mississippi. Um, he is the author of two quite remarkable books, Ever is a Long Time, his first book, and now The House at the End of the Road. They are both, they're difficult books to describe. They aren't memoirs, they aren't exactly family histories, um, although they are rooted in the experience of his family and the ways in which it has crossed racial lines and barriers of prejudice in the 20th century United States. Ralph is an exceptionally smart, interesting man, and by no means, incidentally, one of the nicest people I know. Thank you. Thank you, John, very much for that, that wonderful introduction. And I was, I was telling John, uh, as we were listening to Patricia Smith, I said, I'm a Catholic but she made me shout amen at one point. I actually said it out loud, and I, I didn't know what came over me all of a sudden, but, they, but, but it was very, very moving. <clears throat> uh, I, I am the author of two books, Ever's a Long Time, which is um, described as a memoir, but it's memoir woven in with, with social history, uh, and The House at the End of the Road, which is the story of my grandparents who were an interracial couple who married in Alabama around 1914 uh, and were married until my grandmother died in 1936. Uh, as I've been talking about um, the house at the end of the road, I've often brought a picture of my grandfather with me, uh, which I've had on an easel. It was going to be a rainy day, and I work at the Library of Congress, and I knew that some of our preservation staff would be here and see me with this photograph out. Um, in the rain, but the photograph is actually in the book here, and that is my grandfather, and that picture hung in my, uh, it hangs in my house, but when I was growing up, it really couldn't hang in my house, which is kind of the story of my first book, which is about the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission. Uh, and I went back to Mississippi when I found out that my parents were on this list of people to be watched in Mississippi, because the Sovereignty Commission was Mississippi's spy agency during the Civil Rights Movement. So I went back there after saying that I wasn't going to return to Mississippi after my wife and I were run off a road there in 1990. And, but I, I did go back. And because I'm in the uh, poetry and prose booth, which I'm very honored to, to be here among poets like Patricia Smith and Kay Ryan and Ed Hirsch, uh, I have to start with a poem because it, it's part of a poem that I keep on my desk um, that I think explains one of the reasons I was able to go back to Mississippi in middle age. And it's a poem by Donald Justice. And it's the, it begins, men at 40 learn to close softly the doors they will not be coming back to. So that's what I, I did. I'm going to read from ever is a long time, a bit. I'm going to read from the house at the end of the road. And then I'm going to read something that I just read on Monday for the that I finished last Saturday. Um, I'm going to read here only the second time that I've read it. I read it at a Penn Faulkner event on Monday. But it's a question that I'm always asked at all of my readings. So I'm going to 
go ahead and answer that question for you, and then I hope we'll have some time for some questions. So this is from the first chapter of Ever's a Long Time, and it's called, the first chapter is called Mount Olive, because that's how people say it where I'm from. They, they say Mount, it's Mount Olive, but they run it all together, they say Mount Olive. The years have a way of providing what seems to be an infinite distance, yet somehow that distance helps me feel more intensely the joys of growing up in a small town in Mississippi. Time has made it possible for me to see what I both loved and disliked, as if both sides are placed on a stage in front of me to observe objectively. As I stand back and watch these two sides of my early life, I recognize that it was both the comfort and confinement of small town Mississippi life that prompted me to choose a life away from it. The same forces that nurtured and made me feel secure also suffocated me until I found it unbearable. There are times when I walk city streets and feel my little town of Mount Olive, Mississippi tugging at me, telling me to come back. It's a good feeling one that reminds me of people and places that I love. The calmness of fishing on the banks of a quiet lake, the smell of the food at a summer church revival, and a walk in the hills of my family's farm with my dog. There's no feeling of suffocation, only affection. But I've visited rarely since I left Mount Olive behind, largely resisting the pool and choosing to love the place at a distance. Place opens a door in the mind, Eudora Welty once said, as I tried to unravel the question of how my parents ended up on one of the list of people to be watched by Mississippi segregation watchdogs in the 1960s, one place helped open my mind to the questions of what made my parents and my family marked people, the sleepy Mississippi town of Mount Olive. On its surface, Mount Olive looks like an ordinary small southern town black and white, rich and poor, with a few people caught in between. Mount Olive is a place where nothing ever happens. I remember writing to my cousin, who lived in Mobile, Alabama, a place I thought to be far more exciting than my one stoplight town. But as I began to bridge years of distance, I came to look at the world I knew growing up with a sharper perspective. Much more than I thought happened in that place where nothing ever happens. Tensions and excitement merely disguise themselves in a veneer of quietude, beginning with my own family. Outwardly, we were an ordinary family, a mother, a father, four children. Of the four children, there were three girls, and me, the only boy, which felt like an unfair circumstance rather than an ordinary one to be born into. Like most of Mississippi in the 1960s, we lived on a farm, which made up of 80 acres of rolling green pastures and dark, rich fields planted in vegetables and fruit trees, all common in our part of Mississippi, except that we were black. My parents were college-educated professionals, and the middle-class aspirations my parents held could be viewed as both desirable and threatening. Like a number of black families in Mississippi, we farmed and grew cattle. However, we farmed not as our only means of making a living, but largely because my father was the county agent, or a Negro county agent, as he was labeled back then. My mother held one of the few professional jobs a black woman could have. She was a teacher at a segregated school. Farming our own vegetables and raising our own beef helped my family make ends meet on the meager salaries dictated by Mississippi's system of segregation. Mississippi's social and political system was set up to keep black people poor and uneducated. Even if you had an education, professional options were few, and my parents held jobs that were part of that limited realm. When I was growing up, it all seemed painfully normal, nothing exceptional. But looking back, I realized how extraordinary it was. We lived a dignified life in an undignified system of racial segregation largely ignoring the confines of that system. What I ask myself time and again when I discovered a tie between my parents and the Sovereignty Commission files was, were my parents threatening because of the way they lived their lives? 
along with the feared outside agitating advocates of integration, what I knew and remembered from overhearing snatches of adult conversations was that people like my parents were to be watched and kept in line just to make sure they did not rise above their station and try to be equal to white folks. Together, my parents fit the profile of the dreaded uppity Negroes who had to be kept in check. My mother had bright auburn hair that complemented her creamy freckled skin. She drove fast, wore smart dresses with high heels, and had a mouth more flamboyant than her conservative manner of dress. <laughs> Lucille Richards and Eubanks radiated a sharp, pointed warmth that announced approach with caution. She held nothing back and maintained an undisguised disdain for Mississippi's system of segregation. We don't drink colored water, she would tell us if we went to drink from the water fountain marked colored. Water is colorless, odorless, and tasteless. And she would proclaim that loudly as we drank the cold water from the fountain meant for white people, daring anyone to stop her. Surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, no one ever did. Someone had to balance out my mother's unrestrained boldness, and that job fell to my father. Warren Eubanks was a quiet, dark-skinned man, both the physical and emotional opposite of my mother. Though deceptive, deceptively soft-spoken in demeanor and speech, he stood his ground with white people. Clearly, he approached the world of segregated Mississippi far more gingerly than my mother. In order to survive, he had to. My sisters and I developed within these separate realms of the same family. The unrestrained openness of my mother and the measured yet determined approach of my father. Knowing that I would have to navigate the world as a black man, my father kept me rooted in his realm, taking me with him wherever he went, even to work. My sisters modeled themselves more on my mother's brash personality and style, a characteristic that distinguishes us to this day. The tensions of those two, two worlds came to be balanced thanks to our farm. It threaded our lives together, for the land was both our passion and our pride and joy. Life there revolved not so much around our different personalities and mindsets, but more around the rhythm of the seasons and the work dictated by those seasons. Planting, harvesting, pruning peach trees, moving cattle from pasture to pasture, stacking hay bales. Perhaps it was the rhythm of those 17 years we lived on the farm that masked the extraordinariness I now see in my family, for there was a sameness in what we had to do from season to season and year to year. In the comfort of that routine, each of us developed our own unique set of inner resources to bring excitement to what was an isolated, staid, and ordinary existence. I constructed an inner life for myself that shut out the daily chores on the farm. I wrote letters to children in faraway countries, read books about those places, and imagined myself there even as I played games with my sisters. That same inner life also sequestered me from the topsy-turvy world of race and racism that controlled the Mississippi of my childhood. Shielded by the distance of years, I decided to go back to Mount Olive to take a closer look at a world I sometimes navigated with my eyes only half open. On a crisp fall day in 1999, I drove into Mount Olive, Mississippi, down Main Strip Street for the first time in almost 10 years. And I have to say, I didn't like what I found when I got there. Uh, my town is largely gone now. There are only two stores that are even open on Saturday. It's now 2.30, 1.30 there. Uh, the one store that is open on Saturday is now closed. When I was a boy, it was just completely populated with people. Everybody's migrated to the Walmart down the road in McGee, Mississippi. And it's very sad um, to be there and to, to see that kind of wither away. But that place spoke to me uh, and really made me figure out how my parents ended up on this watch list. Eventually, it set me on a path to three people, um, an ex-Klansman, uh, a member of the Sovereignty Commission, and Ed King, who actually worked, marched with uh, Medgar Evers in Jackson 
to, to see how this was all tangled up with them. So I found how my life in this place where I was living this inner life to keep out what was going on in Mississippi, really opening my eyes to what was going on at the, there for the first time. Now, as I mentioned that there's this photograph of my grandfather, a white man that never hung in my house when I was growing up. It didn't hang there for a couple of reasons. Uh, one was that my father didn't want it in the house. The second was that uh, at that time in Mississippi that I learned, when I, which I learned going through the sovereignty mission files was if you claimed kinship with a white person, um, you could put yourself in some physical danger because that you didn't claim these blood ties with white people. That was just, um, it was just completely taboo. So I want to re read now a little bit from The House at the End of the Road from the prologue to the book, which kind of tells you how I got started on that. I wrote about my grandparents in one paragraph in Ever's A Long Time, talking about the places that my parents came from. And my editor said, I want to know more about these people. And I said, well, that's all I know. Um, so this book was my attempt to find out even more about them and actually get to, to know them as best I could. So I'm going to read a bit now from The House at the End of the Road. The hardest thing I ever did was to ask a white man to marry his daughter. I heard my father say late one night to my mother when they thought I was asleep. Then there was a pause as my father took a drag on his ever-present Salem cigarette. And I'm, and I'm not sorry that I had to do the asking. It's all been worth it. The two of them laughed tenderly, which I felt in their voices, since I could not see the expression on their faces. It was 1973 and I was an innocent 16-year-old boy, blanketed by naivete, lying awake in a room filled with boyhood toys and model airplanes. Though I tried to listen in as my parents talked into the night about how they forged ahead with their marriage in spite of different backgrounds, I remember almost nothing of their whiskey and nicotine fuel discussion. Rather, I remember how puzzlement filled the air of my room like the smoke from my parents' cigarettes and crept into my brain as I attempted to process that my mother's much-loved father was a white man. My grandfather died six months before I was born, so I knew him only through the stories my mother told. I just assumed since my mother was black, so was my grandfather. His race was never discussed, and in Mississippi in the 1960s, it would not have been discussed without severe social consequences for my parents. Now I understood why my grandfather's portrait sat in my parents' closet, emitting a dusky evanescence from behind the closed door. Yet that evening, overcome with adolescent narcissism, I thought only about how what I had just heard affected me. The impact of my mother living in a mixed-race household in the Jim Crow South of the 1930s stood invisibly in a dark corner of the room. With a consciousness rooted in black pride in the Civil Rights Movement, I quickly concluded that my grandfather's race had nothing to do with my racial identity. Soon I was fast asleep, leaving my parents' conversation to drift into the night air. Almost 30 years later, memories of that evening began to come back. My mother and I were together with my daughter Delaney in her school for a classroom presentation about holiday memories. After the children told their stories about family Thanksgivings, Delaney innocently asked my mother to tell her about the most memorable Thanksgiving from her childhood. Holding tightly to her emotions, my mother struggled to tell Delaney about a special Thanksgiving when her mother's friend, Miss Callie, came and made a big dinner just for the children and played games with them. It was painfully clear to me that that was all she could say without losing her composure in front of a kindergartner. When we left the classroom, we stopped on the front steps of the school on the way to the car. What happened that Thanksgiving, Mom? I asked quietly, sensing that she was still upset. Then, 
standing ramrod straight and glancing directly into my eyes, my mother began to tell a story I had never heard. This time I did not let my thoughts drift away as I did all those years ago. Instead, I listened intently as the memories etched lines of pain on her face. When my mother died, for a brief time, I felt like I became invisible, she told me. And the Thanksgiving I was trying to talk about was when my mother died. My mother, Lucille Richardson, was only seven years old at the time, old enough to know what had happened to her mother, but young enough to slither through the rooms of her house unnoticed by her father, who was devastated by his loss. My mother recalled that all the mirrors in the house were covered with thin white sheets, perhaps to keep her mother's spirit at rest. That made it easy to sneak around. As she surreptitiously watched her mother being placed in a casket wearing a powder blue dress with a white lace collar, a dress her mother had sewn with her own hands, Lucille wondered what would happen to her now that her mother was dead. In spite of her ability to hide and eavesdrop, she struggled to decipher what the grown-ups around her were saying about her future. Then, just days after her mother's burial, she found herself sitting on the back seat of a 1936 Ford with her nine-year-old sister, staring through the car's rear window as her white clapboard farmhouse at the end of the road got smaller and smaller in the distance, finally fading into one of the clouds of dust that billowed behind the car. Sent to live with relatives in Mobile, separated from the home she loved, her older siblings and her father, Lucille did not know when she would return. Before she could come back to her house at the end of the road, her father had to figure out what to do with his family. Would they stay in Alabama, or would they move north to pass for white? It was something that was whispered about among the family, something Lucille overheard and finally connected with an incident from a few years before her mother died. That day, her father, Jim, was injured in a logging accident a few miles from their house. After the accident, a group of men, all of them white, brought him to the house. Confused by all the commotion and her father's cry of pain, Lucille turned to her mother's friend, Miss Callie, who had helped form her most vivid Thanksgiving memory, and asked, what's wrong with Jim? To everyone, including his children, her father was known by his first name, without any pretense of formality. Good God almighty, little girl, I didn't ask them what was wrong with that white man, Miss Callie replied. Confused, Lucille turned to Miss Callie and asked, is my daddy a white man? Miss Callie then shouted with disbelief to Lucille's mother, Edna, why didn't you tell that little girl that her daddy was a white man? Because it's her daddy and it doesn't matter, Miss Callie, my grandmother replied. But now, just three years later, whether you were black or white did matter for some reason. The family's future seemed to hang in the balance between the black and white worlds they straddled. The town doctor who pronounced her mother dead offered to help the family start over, far away from rural Alabama, as a white family. Even some of her lighter-skinned black relatives talked about how the Richardson family could slip into the white world unnoticed. Although Edna was black, all the children's birth certificates said they were white. So it would have been easy. In the end, Jim Richardson chose not to hide his children's mixed race behind a lie. The family was reunited, and Jim chose to make his children acknowledge who they were, rather than to see themselves the way the rest of the world chose to see them. To this day, no one in the Richardson family has regretted making what seemed at the time the harder of the two choices. This is the story of why they made that choice and how it has reverberated through the family for three generations. Now, whenever I read, everyone asks me this question about why I don't sound like a Southerner. Um, so I'm going to read something. I can do it in three minutes. I did this uh, three minutes on, on Monday. So. Where's your southern accent? That's a question I've been asked many times. Once I reveal that my roots are deep in rural Mississippi rather than in some other part of the country. The question about 
the absence of a regional accent in my voice comes from relative strangers, some of whom demand an answer with the intensity of a cross-examination. In spite of how I'm asked, the answer is simple. Along the way, I made a choice to lose my accent. Most of the time, I just avoid the question entirely. But I can't stand before all of you right now, speaking in a voice that is admittedly an affectation, without revealing the story behind the voice, one that cuts to the core of who I am as a writer. As a self-conscious young boy giving a recitation in church, I overheard someone say that I sounded country. Today, I know the observation was true, but hearing those words hurt. Country where I grew up meant unlearned and ignorant. A slow, lyrical draw was acceptable. Sounding like a field hand who never crossed the threshold of a school was not. Later, listening to a recording of my voice, I admit I didn't like what I heard. It's funny how the mere cadence of your voice can lock you into a category or stereotype almost as much as your race or ethnicity. While my manner of speaking was not identified with a Henry Higgins-like precision telling me precisely which part of the woods I came out of, I knew where the voice was coming from. Jimmy Tugwell's Country Capers show from WSJC in McGee, Mississippi, number 81 on your AM dial. I loved listening to Jimmy Tugwell every morning, the sound of his twangy voice wafting into my bedroom alongside the smell of coffee, eggs, and bacon. Unconsciously, I absorbed Jimmy's speech into my voice. After that day in church, I became an incorrigible eavesdropper. I began to listen, not only to what people said, but to every inflection of their voices, particularly people from outside the South. Whether it was the pretty new girl in my class from Massachusetts or a complete stranger visiting from New York, I listened to every word with a feverish intensity. Clear Channel Radio became a late night friend. The fast, sometimes clipped tones I heard from distant northern cities became a counterbalance to Jimmy Tugwell and crept into my speech in time. Then I learned to call a writing implement a pen and a stiff piece of wire a pin, distinguishing between specific vowel sounds unlike most southerners. I stopped elongating words and dropping G's. My mission was accomplished. I didn't sound country anymore. And when asked where I was from, I love telling people I was from Mount Olive, Mississippi, population 800, and watching their sense of disbelief. <laughs> but when you lose a piece of your identity, a strange sense of longing sneaks up on you in middle age. As I might have said as a boy, that feeling just whops you upside your head and knocks you flat. Perhaps that's why as a man, well, over the age of 40, I found myself back on the side of the farm where I grew up, trying to piece together my life there. My old southern voice was gone, perhaps lost forever, and I began to cry because somehow I had to find it, and writing helped me do just that. Looking for my old southern self, a country boy who grew up on a hot two-lane blacktop and spoke with elongated vowel sounds awakened the writer inside me. I may have erased Mississippi from my voice, but the place and how it shaped the way I look at the world helped make me a writer. At this moment, you may not hear my real accent, the way I sometimes speak when I'm completely relaxed and among friends. Instead, my accent lies deep in my soul and reveals itself on the page. That is the place where I feel safe expressing the part of who I am that few people hear when I speak. Thank you all very much. So I, so I want to thank all of y'all for letting this country boy talk to you today. Bye, y'all.